Hey, how's it going guys? It's Nate here. And welcome to part two of our Fallout Mysteries Iceberg. Last month, we began work on this project and broke down tiers one and two out of five. In today's video, we're probably just going to be able to complete tier three, as it's absurdly huge. I'm pretty proud of how part one turned out, but I think this video, by virtue of going deeper into the iceberg and covering even more obscure and suspicious topics, will be even better. You know, the first couple of tiers in an iceberg are always the basic stuff that most people already have a pretty good understanding of. But now we get to start diving into the more interesting stuff that I'm hoping will be more new and fascinating to y'all. Anyway, brevity is the essence of wit, so no point in me drawing out this intro any longer. Ladies and gentlemen, have your Mrs. Handy sear up a fresh Brahmin steak, pour yourself out a glass of Bob Rob's finest, and relax as we dive into part two of our Fallout Mysteries Iceberg. But first, a quick word from this video's sponsor. This video is being brought to you guys by Air Up, a new type of water bottle which flavors your beverages with aromatized pods instead of a bunch of sugars and suspicious chemicals. Since I learned where aspartame comes from earlier this year, I've slowly been breaking my diet soda addiction, and Air Up has been a useful tool in allowing me to soothe my sweet tooth without ingesting a bunch of strange processed biomatter and phosphoric acid. Furthermore, as someone who enjoys biking, hiking, and climbing, the bottle is resilient enough to tolerate the most rigorous of activities. The pods and bottle work together in tandem to infuse every sip with scented bubbles, which flavor your drink for zero calories. I'm personally a fan of filling my bottles with carbonated or sparkling water. I, I don't know if this is real or not, but I just feel like the carbonation in the drink carries the scent a little bit better, but that's just me. When you're done with this video, be sure to check out my link in the description and pinned comment, and check out AirUp's website for more information. Now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. Starting off, whatever happened to Dr. Zimmer? Dr. Zimmer, for those of you who don't know, was the former head of the Institute's Synth Retention Bureau, basically their division that's dedicated to recapturing escaped synths. Interestingly, we met him back in Fallout 3, well before the Institute was really fleshed out at all. Zimmer would approach the player in Rivet City, explain his credentials, and request your assistance in tracking down an escaped synth which he believed was hiding in the capital wasteland. Zimmer would offer us a boatload of caps and a unique perk if we agreed to the task. Long story short, the Lone Wanderer would eventually discover that a Rivet City security guard named Harkness was the escaped android Zimmer was after, and we'd have to decide whether to turn him in or lie to the doctor and convince Zimmer that his target was uncatchable. Whatever the case, the elderly man would return to the Commonwealth afterward. So, given that this man was apparently the head of the SRB, an agency we work very closely with in Fallout 4, where exactly is Zimmer in Fallout 4's institute? Shouldn't we be meeting him? Why is he absent? Well, at first glance, the most obvious and immediate answer to those questions is that he's passed away or retired. Fallout 4 takes place 10 years following the events of 3, and Zimmer was already pretty old, so it stands to reason that age may have finally gotten the best of him. Alas, we learn that that's clearly not the case. You see, by the time we arrive at the Institute in Fallout 4, the Synth Retention Bureau is being led by a man named Justin Ayo. But, when spoken to, Mr. Ayo only identifies himself as the temporary acting director, not the division's formal permanent head. When pressed on that identification, Ayo will admit that Dr. Zimmer is still the true head of the SRB, but he's currently away from the Commonwealth, supervising the retrieval of some high-profile units. Take a listen. If you're the acting head of the SRB, 
Who were you filling in for? Dr. Zimmer holds that position. He's supervising the retrieval of some of the more high-profile units. In his absence, I keep things running smoothly. So, the doctor is clearly still alive, and he has retained his position over the decade. Furthermore, throughout the Institute complex, we can find various terminals that allude to the execution of orders Zimmer had given prior to his departure. So, AO isn't even our only source, he's mentioned rather frequently. But what's he doing, where is he at, and what makes these specific synths so important? Well, a look in Fallout 4's game files reveals several unused assets, particularly a voice file marker for Dr. Zimmer that, for whatever reason, is just floating around in the creation kit unused. It's likely that at some point in time, Bethesda was considering giving the character an NPC role in the game, but ultimately changed their minds and decided against it. It's not obvious why, though. His original voice actor, Paul Eiding, voiced several other characters in Fallout 4, so it's not like Bethesda ran into an issue with him, he was already on their payroll. The fact that they specifically refer to Zimmer as being alive suggests that Bethesda, at least at the time, still wanted to allow room for him to return, perhaps in an unused DLC idea, or maybe they're even planning an appearance in the next mainline Fallout game, which is probably around 10 years away. Still, this does provide an excuse for Zimmer to be alive in the future, even if the player does decide to destroy the Institute. Because remember, he's out there somewhere. But wherever somewhere is, and whatever he's doing, remain some of the game's biggest unanswered questions. Next on our list, Speaking of Dr. Zimmer and the SRB, within the Institute's Synth Retention Bureau wing, there exists a terminal with an entry titled Reclamation Target Tracking. This serves as a database for many of the known synths who have escaped and are being targeted for recapture. If the player ends up siding with the Institute, we'll actually end up helping the faction recover most of the targets on this very list in their side quests. With one exception. You see, on this database, there is one synth mentioned whom we never encounter or hear about at all throughout the game. A unit named S943. Here's its entry. Unit ID. S9-43. Status. Unit at large. Investigation suspended. C notes. Assigned courser. None. Location, last sighting, Boston Airport. Notes, investigation suspended, area deemed too hazardous at this time. End quote. So there's a missing synth last sighted near the Boston Airport, whom the Institute's essentially given up on tracking for now, deeming the area too hazardous to investigate. Now, by the time the sole survivor is actually able to visit the Institute and read this terminal, the Brotherhood of Steel will have already arrived in the Commonwealth in force and taken over the Boston Airport area, which may explain the organization's hesitancy to press this any further. But still, though, who could this S943 unit be, and why were they last spotted at the airport? Well, Paladin Dance's name is often dropped in this conversation. We know that he's a famous Brotherhood of Steel Paladin who turns out to be a synth, which would explain the presence at the airport, but we already know that his designation is M7-97. We learn that during the events of the Brotherhood of Steel questline, so he can be definitively ruled out as a suspect. Aside from Dance, we know of no other synths within the Brotherhood of Steel or at the Boston airport at all, making this a very difficult investigation to pursue. In fact, we don't even find any paladins with a synth component in their inventory. So who could it be? Well, while I can't explain the Boston airport part of this, I do have my own theory on who S943 could be, or at least what type of synth it may be. You see, upon the sole survivor's first visit to the Institute, we'll encounter a synthetic version of our son, Sean, 
who will be stuck in a cell behind some plexiglass, and who will talk to for a bit before Father enters the room and reveals himself to be the Institute's leader and our actual child. In this dialogue sequence, Father will briefly refer to the little android as Unit S9-2-3 when putting it to sleep. Sure. S923, recall code Cirrus. Fascinating, but disappointing. I suspect that maybe S943 could be a similar model to Childhood Sean, given the very similar designations they share, which are separated by merely a single digit. Perhaps S943 literally is another Sean robot, or another unique adolescent synth, which would explain its importance. Still though, what was it doing at the Boston airport? Prior to the Brotherhood of Steel's arrival, the location was occupied by a massive horde of feral ghouls. So even if S943 was spotted there before the BOS showed up, it was still an incredibly dangerous location to be in, with no known human or railroad presence that would explain everything. Suffice to say, whatever this mischievous synth was up to, only it knows, and it won't share. Coming in at number three, what happened to Three Dog? Okay, so this mystery is interesting, because there's both a narrative component and a somewhat meta behind the scenes element as well. For those of you who don't know, Three Dog was the iconic disc jockey of Galaxy News Radio in Fallout 3. His enigmatic personality and upbeat tone easily made him one of the game's most iconic characters. And it didn't hurt that Three Dog's voice actor, Eric Todd Dellums, gave perhaps the best performance of the game. Throughout Fallout 3, the GNR DJ would spew good vibes, old world tunes, and occasional updates on the events of the world, often referencing and cheering on the Lone Wanderer. Hey everybody, this is Three Dog, your friendly neighborhood disc jockey. What's a disc? Hell if I know, but I'm gonna keep talking anyway. What rhymes with shoes and often gives you the blues? That's right, it's time for the cashews! Okay, that doesn't really rhyme. We would eventually encounter the man himself during the events of the game's main questline, discovering him broadcasting out of the old Washington Monument, where he would aid us in our search for Liam Neeson and offer a bit more insight into his backstory describing how his rough upbringing led him to value the good in the world and the importance of free airwaves, reminding us to always fight the good fight. Honestly, Three Dog very much deserves his own hour-long video. But again, the real reason I bring him up now is to ask what happened to the man? Well, there are a couple of references to him in Fallout 4, but they're rather vague. After defeating the Institute, assuming you chose to do so, Diamond City Radio DJ Travis Miles will state that an old friend taught him the importance of fighting the good fight. A clear nod to Three Dog. I also have it on good authority that the Vault Dweller was on scene. You know, an old friend once told me, you gotta always fight the good fight. It looks like someone we know. Did just that. Alas, we have very little knowledge about Miles' past, making it unclear how he and his Fallout 3 predecessor actually could have known each other. Later on, Fallout 4 would receive a Creation Club add-on called Wasteland Mercenaries, which was arguably its largest creation ever, and it would have the player travel by Vertibird to the Galaxy News Plaza back in the capital Wasteland, to answer a distress call coming from an organization calling themselves the Good Fighters. The Good Fighters, as we would learn, are a Minuteman-like band in the DC area, made up of reformed mercenaries and raiders inspired by Three Dog's old message, who seek to make order out of the chaos and help the local citizenry. Anyway, we'd arrive at GNR Plaza and find the Good Fighters being attacked by a band of Talon Company mercs. The player would have to fight off the baddies and restore GNR Plaza to its rightful owners. 
Now, unfortunately, while we can encounter various Good Fighter NPCs, none of them offer any unique dialogue. This is a common theme of Creation Club creations. Evidently, Bethesda had some sort of legal or technical issue with the sound localization and actors that prevent them from doing this. So instead, the story is entirely conveyed via notes and terminal entries. Interestingly, once we had retaken the plaza, we'd learned from various journals that the real brains behind this whole Good Fighters operation was not Three Dog, but instead a ghoul named Phil Goodman. Get it? Phil Goodman, Phil Goodman, anyway. In Phil's terminals, he explains that several years ago, he heard Three Dog's message on the airways, and that inspired him to keep going in a dark time. After the success of Project Purity, things got better for a while. But according to Phil, sometime between the events of Fallout 3 and 4, Three Dog disappeared. Phil doesn't actually elaborate on what happened, he simply notes that the old DJ mysteriously went missing. That inspired Mr. Goodman to take up the mantle and begin rebroadcasting Three Dog's old positive vibes, and he was eventually able to build up a following and organize his listeners into the Minuteman-like band we meet. Nonetheless, Phil evidently passed away during the Talon Company siege, and we can find his remains next to his desk which we can loot for some unique armor, but I digress. This creation seems to imply that in the 10 years separating Fallouts 3 and 4, Three Dog disappeared under suspicious circumstances. Very bizarre indeed. Okay, now remember how I said this mystery has both a lore-rooted narrative component and a sort of meta behind-the-scenes element? Well, getting to that second part, Back in 2013, during Fallout 4's development, Three Dog's voice actor, Eric Dellums, posted this now-deleted tweet. Quote, To all my Fallout 3 and Three Dog fans, there may be more of the dog coming. Fingers crossed. Alas, as we unfortunately now know in hindsight, there was not actually any more of the dog coming. His character does not appear in the game at all. So, what was this tweet about? It seems to heavily imply that he or his agent was approached about the character, and yet nothing. Mr. Dellums would later put out a few more, also now deleted tweets, expressing his disappointment at Three Dogs Return not materializing, and suggesting that he was never even given an audition for the game. What gives? Not only was Three Dog not included, but they didn't even ask the voice actor to come back and voice any other characters, which he seems to have clearly been fine doing as well. So what happened? Did Bethesda perhaps entertain the idea of a DJ comeback and then change their mind? Dellums' initial tweets in 2013 were made at a time when Fallout 4 information was kept very hush-hush, and Dellums deleted them within days. So, perhaps the studio was upset at this minor leak. Whatever the case, the Capital Wasteland Mercenaries expansion clearly leaves open the possibility for perhaps a return of Three Dog in the future. But why he was excluded from Fallout 4, and why his voice actor was just entirely snubbed, remain a very suspicious mystery, indeed. For fourth spot, who are E and S? Let me explain. In Fallout 3, just south of Megaton, the Lone Wanderer can find a unique rock that's not like most others. It's been hollowed out and acts as a container, a chest if you will. Inside, we'll find two stim packs, a stealth boy, a sniper, and a holotape titled As Requested, which reads as follows. Quote S. Here's that stuff you wanted. If anyone asks where you got it, say it was a gift from your grandma. Happy hunting. Signed, E. So someone, apparently called E, was giving another individual a small kit of hunting gear. Whether this was meant to hunt food or people, or hey, maybe both, isn't elaborated upon. But it seems the person this was all destined to get to never got it. And now it's ours. 
Funnily enough, ten years later in Fallout 4, we can find more evidence of this mysterious couple. Within another hollowed-out rock, this one just outside the Museum of Witchcraft in Salem, lies more gear. Though this time just being random leveled loot, with an untitled note, which reads, S. Been too long. Sorry I missed you at Megaton. Looks like history repeats itself. But, as promised, here's the gear I scrounged up. All the best. Stay safe. The Commonwealth is its own kind of hell. E. Looks like these mysterious fellers have stricken again, and have evidently made the journey from the Capital Wasteland to Boston in the last decade, indicating at their continued survival. But what are they doing here? Why are they so uniquely secretive, and why are they sharing gear like this? Like, what's stopping them from just, you know, meeting up like normal people? Well, I suppose only Todd Howard knows, and Todd Howard won't tell. Next on our list is Fallout 4's dog meat more than just a canine. You see, pretty much every single game in the franchise has afforded our hero the ability to recruit a friendly canine companion to accompany us on our journey. The dog is pretty much always named Dogmeat, though his age and breed vary throughout the games. In Fallout 3, he appears as some kind of blue healer mix, while in the isometric games, the dog is dark, almost pit bull-like, or maybe some kind of ferocious lab. Well, in Fallout 4, the helpful hound takes the appearance of a suspiciously well-groomed German Shepherd, and plays a much more integral role in the game's story than previous iterations. We encounter this version of dog meat just kinda waiting for us outside of the vault by the Red Rocket truck stop, and from there, he helps lead us to Kellogg and the Institute shortly after. His strangely healthy appearance, and the fact that he just sort of comes up to us as soon as we start the game, without really requiring us to earn his affection at all, has led some players to start asking some questions. Indeed, much of the community believes that Dogmeat may have actually been an Institute synth designed by Sean and company to help lead the player back to them. It sounds pretty tinfoil hat crazy, but I think there's good reason to consider this possibility. For one, we know that the Institute has the capacity to manufacture synthetic animals, and they're quite good at it. If they can replicate gorillas and birds, there's no reason a simple dog would be beyond their purview. Furthermore, and here's what really makes me wonder, within the Institute, on Sean's desk, lies a copy of the astoundingly awesome Tales magazine, issue number 12, titled Have Dog, Will Travel, and features a similar German Shepherd and his human on the cover. What is this magazine doing in the Institute, in Sean's room no less? It's hard to imagine that the developers didn't know what they were doing when they placed this. Interestingly, in 2017, Joel Burgess, a lead Bethesda Game Studios developer who worked on Fallout 4, and whose dog was actually used for the motion capture and visual inspiration of Fallout 4's dog meat, had this to say about the discussion. Not necessarily putting any of the rumors to rest, but summarizing Bethesda's position on the nature of this pop. Quote, I suppose this gets at the big idea behind Dogmeat's relationship to you in Fallout 4. Like your character, Dogmeat is caught out of time. This dog doesn't belong here and neither do you. Anyone looking for confirmation of their preferred Dogmeat origin lore, sorry. There are several intentionally conflicting clues to this in the game, I can't slash won't tell you which theory is true. The strange thing about Dogmeat is that there's nothing strange about Dogmeat. Dogmeat is a tether, he grounds you to the world, will always stand by you, lead you to your family, and anticipate your needs. He wants you to be safe and happy. In other words, he loves you. Next on our list, what happened to the residents of Vault 19? So, Vault 19 is a large, 
Vault, located east of Bonnie Springs and north of the Quarry Junction in Fallout, New Vegas. As an abundance of abandoned holotapes and terminal entries reveal, Vault 19 was once the subject of one of the company's more interesting psychological experiments. The residents were essentially divided into two separate tribes, the Reds and the Blues, and each given their own section of the vault to occupy, and even their own overseer and staff. Both teams were expected to operate their own services, manage their own food and water supplies, and essentially live as entirely separate communities, with a limited number of common areas where the two tribes would interact. The experiment seems to have been designed in order to examine how separate factions would resolve conflict and relationships while living in the same enclosed space. Spoiler alert, not well. While initially, in the months following the Great War, the residents of Vault 19 all seem to have gotten along fine, and even enjoyed a bit of harmony. There's evidence that children were regularly being born, and several generations of dwellers may have persisted. Things, however, slowly began to take a turn for the worse. The vault Tech company had designed the vault with several automated systems to ensure that conflict and paranoia would fester no matter what. Water and oxygen filtration systems would deliberately break down, causing the factions to blame each other. Strange, ultra-high-frequency sounds would randomly play through the night, disrupting sleep and leaving the societies irritable and more vulnerable to paranoia. The terminal entries left behind by the factions suggests that tensions were coming to a head, and Voltec's plan to destroy their harmony was easily coming to fruition. However, unfortunately, we never actually find out what happened here. While the data we have heavily suggests tensions were beginning to boil over, there's no evidence of an actual conflict ever emerging, nor any serious signs of violence in the vault. By the time the courier arrives in Vault 19, it'll be occupied by a gang of escaped NCR inmates, calling themselves the Powder Gangers. And they claim that when they found the vault, it was simply abandoned. One of the more interesting things about the Powder Gangers is that their existing living situation in Vault 19 kinda mimics what the Dwellers were going through. In of it, that they're divided between two separate camps. One led by a Mr. Samuel Cook, who is very ambitious and has some pretty broad plans, and another by a more passive and realistic Mr. Lem, who seeks to not get all of his men killed through ridiculous strategies, and is even open to negotiation with the NCR. There's some evidence in the creation kit that Obsidian Entertainment planned for the Vault 19 storyline to go much deeper and be much more in-depth. Vault 19 even has its own ending slide after the credits, which is odd given how short the actual story is in-game, so it's possible that there was a lot more meant to be here that just wasn't fleshed out given the extraordinary time limitations the developers were working with. Furthermore, the Powder Gangers reveal to us that they prefer to occupy only the upper parts of the vault closer to the entrance, as the deeper chambers have been overrun with an infestation of fire geckos, which they prefer to avoid. We the player, after breaking through a few doors, can access these lower floors and encounter the creatures. Evidently, Vault 19 was built above a large sulfur cave as well. It's not obvious whether or not vault Tech did that on purpose, and now the gecko population has broken into the structure itself. But there's no evidence that these mutated lizards are what was responsible for the Volt's abandonment. We encounter no human skeletons, no signs of a struggle. It seems as though the creatures came in after the dwellers made their exodus. Some folks have proposed that maybe the Powder Gangers themselves are responsible for what happened here. You know, maybe the Volt wasn't as abandoned as they said it was when they found it, and they violently took it over. However, again, there's little evidence for that. While the Powder Gangers are raider-adjacent, if you will, you know, they make a living raiding caravans and whatnot, they're not necessarily needlessly brutal or cruel people. They don't operate that way. They don't like killing civilians just for the heck of it. And even if that were the case, the geckos were obviously already here before they were, so it just doesn't make up. The chronology's not there. 
Alas, whatever happened to the original residents of Vault 19, wherever they are, whatever became of their stories, is a secret that only Josh Sawyer knows. And Josh Sawyer is keeping to himself. Next on our list, who is Deacon? Okay, well, that's kinda easy. Deacon is one of the railroad's leading agents. An eccentric master of disguise and intrigue, he has dedicated his life to leveraging his talents to free as many synths as possible from the Institute's clutches. And, should the sole survivor join the railroad ourselves, the bald-headed, sunglass-wearing spy will act as our mentor and become a close companion. But, more specifically, who is he? Like, what's his real name? Where does he come from? And why has he chosen this line of work? You see, most railroad agents have deeply personal reasons for serving the faction, which we learn about as the game progresses. Some are escaped synths themselves, others used to have deeply personal relationships with certain synths, and some are just bleeding hearts. But Deacon will never tell you his true motives. And as a matter of fact, he is a pathological liar. After the player has built his companion affinity a bit and reached its first positive level, Deacon will do that thing companions do and pull us aside to tell us he wants to talk. Where he'll reveal that he's a synth. Well, I guess I'm a little lucky then. What's done is done, and the upshot is you're in a position where you can act openly. If you go to ground, there's little the coursers can do about it. It doesn't matter much to me. I'm a synth. At least that's what they tell me. So I really don't have anything to lose. You're a synth? Why didn't you tell me before? I don't like talking about it. I was one of the first synths they did the whole cranium reboot on, so it was a bit of a botched job. Most synths have fun fake memories. A happy home, a family. Me, I got nothing. And that, well, it does something to you. Since we're traveling together, I want you to take this. It's my recall code. If you ever need to know something about the Institute, read it to me. Except he's lying. He has no synth component in his inventory, and his recall code is complete bogus. He's just messing with us. Indeed, every time we level up Deacon's affinity, he'll simply spin another lie about his past. Desdemona, the railroad's leader, claims that she thinks Deacon's past is unknowable. Evidently, he's the only agent who's been with the faction longer than she has, and when she joined decades ago, he was already a leading figure. Making matters even weirder is the fact that Deacon can be encountered stalking the player at various points throughout the game. During our first visit to Diamond City, where the player and Piper must convince the security team to open the gates for us, Deacon can be spotted disguised as a Diamond City security guard. Later on, we can spot him impersonating a caravan guard at Bunkin Hill and as a patron at the Memory Den when we visit it with Nick Valentine. There's even a small outpost overlooking Vault 111 with an allied rail sign marker on it. Perhaps Deacon had been watching us since the beginning. What's so weird about this, you know, besides the obvious thing, is that we can catch him doing this stuff well before the Soul Survivor ever interacts with the Railroad or Institute. Deacon must have known something about us from the beginning. Notably, he seems to have been doing this spying without the knowledge or assent of the rest of the Railroad, as when we join, everyone does appear to be genuinely clueless about who we are. As a matter of fact, when we first find out where the Railroad is based, Desdemona even contemplates executing the player before Deacon intervenes and vouches on our behalf. So Deacon seems to have been doing this on his own, completely of his own accord. But why? He never brings up his previous stalking of our character throughout the entire game, leaving us with some big questions. So whatever Deacon's motives are, whatever his past and true identity may be, only he knows. And Deacon is a liar! Next on our list. So I know we've already talked about this one extensively on the channel, but no Fallout Iceberg could reasonably be complete without it. 
the Dunwich Mystery. This, of course, refers to the fact that in Fallout 3, there was a building called the Dunwich Building on the southeastern corner of the map. The structure once served as the corporate headquarters of a company known as Dunwich Borers LLC, which specialized in the production of advanced mining equipment, particularly rock tunneling drills, and operated several mines and quarries across the Old World. When the player would encounter the ghoul-infested Dunwich building, it'd function as a sort of haunted house, and we'd find ourselves subject to a whole host of bizarre, paranormal experiences. Objects would fly across the screen seemingly at random, and we'd witness bizarre, supernatural hallucinations. Eventually, we'd reach the structure's basement, where we'd discover a mysterious black obelisk, ominously alluding to a grander Lovecraftian mystery. Later on, several years later, Fallout 4 would feature another location, called Dunwich Borers on the map, which itself was a large quarry supposedly once operated by the company, but now in the custody of some raiders. Like the previous building, this place had some very supernatural and paranormal themes. We'd get more hallucinations, the raiders would seem a little bit off, there'd be this loud thumping sound in the background, and we'd even witness what seems to have been a pre-war human sacrifice in a flashback. Very chilling stuff. As you might imagine, the presence of these two locations in the games have given rise to a tremendous amount of speculation and various community theories. As we'll explore throughout the iceberg, the Dunwich mystery is a pretty massive thing that goes well beyond these two places. In fact, part of the reason I've chosen to mention it so early right now in Tier 3 is that as we get deeper in the iceberg, we'll find multiple component mysteries or layers to this theme which we'll discuss further, and building the foundation now will help us with that. Also, if you're interested in a more thorough deep dive of this topic, feel free to check out the investigation I uploaded this past January, which I think offers the most satisfying explanation yet, but for now, let's continue on with our berg. Coming in at number 9, Pickman's paintings refer to the mysterious artworks created by an enigmatic murderer named Pickman, who resides in his gallery townhouse in Boston's North End. Evidently, Pickman has a lust for inflicting death upon others and turning their remains into bizarre, avant-garde works of art. Thankfully, the man exclusively targets raiders to be his victims as he has no desire to harm innocents, making him a sort of Dexter-like anti-hero. Whatever the case, when the player finds themselves at his gallery, we'll discover it being besieged by a small army of very angry raiders, desperate to avenge their fallen brothers and put an end to this madman who's been harassing their community. The player will ultimately be given the choice between saving Pikmin from these baddies, not the fun kind, or letting the raiders get their justice. Whatever the case, what I'm really interested in here is the nature of these paintings. They depict strange, almost eldritch-like scenes, emphasizing enormous eyes and very distressed images. What's he describing here? While it would be easy to write these artworks off as just the musings of a madman, there are some subtle implications that Pikmin has some association with the Dunwich mystery we mentioned earlier. For one, like Dunwich, Pikmin's story is inspired by one of H.P. Lovecraft's famous short stories, specifically Pikmin's Model, published in 1927, which tells the tale of an artist driven mad by occult forces and who began incorporating human remains into his pieces. Furthermore, perhaps even more damning, is that in Fallout Shelter, Bethesda's Fallout-themed mobile game, where players get to build their own vaults and collect dwellers, we can actually meet a somewhat sane version of Pikmin very briefly. In it, he blatantly claims that he was driven mad by an elder evil, 
And since recovering his sanity, he's been investigating the Dunwich Company and their quarries. Whoa. This is a pretty obvious smoking gun at this point. Pickman's inspiration was the same entity behind the mysterious stuff happening at the Dunwich Company. But how it infected him, and what exactly it's leading him to produce, remain anything but obvious. Next up, what on Earth, or I suppose in the solar system, was the Sea of Tranquility conflict? So allow me to explain. Within Fallout 4's Museum of Freedom, there's this large mural which depicts American participation in several ancient conflicts. There's a scene displaying the Revolutionary War, one of the Pacific Front from World War II, another displaying the liberation of Anchorage, Alaska, and one depicting what seems to be a battle in space, with an armed astronaut being watched over by spacecraft. The scene appears to be lunar in character. They're on the moon, there's what looks to be a lunar lander behind them, and a bronze plaque in front of the whole scene reinforces this theory. The plaque reads, this mural commemorates the many sacrifices of the brave men and women of the United States Armed Forces. From Lexington to Concord, to the shores of Iwo Jima. From the Sea of Tranquility to the Anchorage front line, Americans have fought and died through the ages to secure our nation's freedom. May their sacrifices remind us all that freedom is a privilege afforded to the many, but hard won by a noble few. So, this plaque seems to describe the aforementioned scene as the Sea of Tranquility, which further implies that it took place on the lunar surface, as the Mare Tranquillitatis, or Sea of Tranquility in Latin, was literally the region of the moon first explored by the Apollo 11 astronauts. It earned that name because ancient astronomers saw it on the moon appearing as a dark spot and thought it was a sea region. The position of the scene after World War II, but before the liberation of Anchorage, also heavily implies that whatever happened here took place between those two events, so sometime in between 1945 and 2077. Now, in the Fallout universe, the Apollo program never actually existed. Or at least, it wasn't called that. Instead, there was a parallel operation called Valiant 11, which landed on the moon in November of 1969, and the final manned American lunar expedition took place in the year 2052 with the Valiant 12 at least according to Fallout 3's Museum of Technology, where a placard in front of a flag says, quote, This unusual flag was recovered from the surface of the moon by the very last manned flight to its surface in 2052. The flag is from the old Valiant 12, Virgo 3 lunar lander, that touched down in November 14, 1969. Its remarkable condition can be attributed to its construction, the flag is actually made of special materials designed to withstand the harsh environment of space." End quote. So unless the Sea of Tranquility conflict depicted by this mural is some secret government operation hidden from public record, which is unlikely given that this is a public mural in a very popular museum, whatever happened on the Sea of Tranquility very likely occurred between November 14th, 1969 and 2052. Now that we have the where and when, the only final question is who was America's adversary in this conflict? The most obvious answer would be China, however the Sino-American War didn't break out until 2066, and there's no evidence of such blatant hostilities between the nations before then. Was it perhaps an unrevealed third nation? Did American astronauts go toe-to-toe -to -toe with aliens perhaps? For now. The answers remain anything but obvious. Next on our list, what are the Mothmen? Okay, well, that's easy. They're mysterious cryptid characters who take the form of giant moths and appear rarely as random encounters in Fallout 76. They also seem to have inspired a small cult of deranged, hostile worshippers in Point Pleasant, 
who seek to violently convert all non-believers. But more specifically, where do Mothmen come from? What are their origins, and what do they seek? Well, under normal circumstances, it would be reasonable to assume that they're just another mutated product of the Great War. We know that the radioactive fires of October of 2077 produced all sorts of giant insects and little organisms, so big moths wouldn't really be much of a break from the norm. However, this hypothesis falls apart when you realize that Mothmen started appearing well before the Great War happened. Indeed, all throughout Appalachia, holotapes and notes can be found left behind by pre-war witnesses to the Mothmen, suggesting that they've been among us for a while, and whatever created them had little to do with rads. Now, if you're fortunate enough to come across these guys several times, you'll notice that there's actually many different Mothman variants, usually most identifiable from their eye color. The most common, Red Mothman, is peaceful, though prefers to avoid humans as regularly as possible. Yellow-eyed Mothmen, called Vengeful Mothmen, are hostile and will actively attack any target they deem vulnerable. The purple-eyed, wise Mothman is rather benevolent and seems to actually want to help humans more than anything. There are a few holotapes which suggest that these purple-eyed Mothmen have actually communicated with man and are mostly friendly. All of these variants boast the ability to teleport before a black cloud of smoke, with the more peaceful types using this power to flee, and the more aggressive ones taking advantage of it as a battle tactic. A very strange and supernatural power indeed. Finally, within an enclave research base which we visit during the Brotherhood of Steel questline, we'll encounter a Mothman infected with the Scorched Plague, which has broken free of its cell and is very hostile to the player. This seems to imply that the Enclave was very aware of these mysterious cryptids and actively studying them. Now, of course, as many of you are aware, Mothmen are a real-life phenomenon. Or, well, maybe they're not real life, but at least their existence has been reported in real life, and they're sort of a Bigfoot-like cryptid in West Virginia. People report seeing them before serious disasters strike, and it's suspected that they may serve as a sort of warning of incoming danger, or perhaps a bringer of it. Fallout 76 plays with this concept a little bit. There are a handful of holotapes we can encounter throughout Appalachia, where old pre-war citizens report seeing the creature out in the distance and trying to get the police's attention to little avail. Regardless, much like the real-world Mothman, it's very unlikely that we're going to get any answers anytime soon. Next on our list, the Bridgekeeper refers to a unique random encounter the player can have in Fallout 2. And boy, is it weird. So, in Fallout 2, the way random encounters work is that when the player is traveling from one major location to another, you do so on this sort of separate map, and during that traveling state, depending on your own level and perks, you'll have the chance to be interrupted by random events that demand your attention. Throughout the remainder of this iceberg, we'll touch on several of such events in the isometric Fallout games. But for right now, I want to focus on one in particular, the Bridge Keeper. The Bridge Keeper is a mysterious, robed and hooded entity who will appear before the player as you need to cross a bridge and block your path, lest you answer three of his questions. The questions and their degree of confusion will actually vary depending on the player's intelligence stat. The lower it is, the harder everything will be and answering any of them incorrectly will result in sudden death as your character explodes. Alternatively, if you're able to answer all of them to the entity's satisfaction, he'll step aside and allow you to pass. Alternatively, the Chosen One can simply engage in combat with the being in order to secure passage. But be warned, this guy is no pushover. It's not easy. In his dialogue, the Bridge Keeper alludes to being an agent working on behalf of some undisclosed employer, and if you get all of his questions right, 
He'll suggest that he's growing sick of his current job and really wants to become a mechanic, as there's more money in that field. So, who is this man? Who's his mysterious boss, and why are they asking random travelers such high-stakes, intense questions? Well, only Tim Kaine knows, and Tim Kaine won't tell. Getting close to the end here at number 13, a very unlucky number, what went down at the Makra fish packing plant? So, the Makra fish packing plant is a small industrial location on the northeastern edges of Fallout 4's map. Upon the Soul Survivor's arrival, they'll find the plant mostly abandoned, but littered with the remains of the various raiders who once occupied this site. Outside, in the parking lot, is a small truck with a bed and some supplies, as well as a railroad dead drop ensign, which may suggest that the raiders here had some sort of agreement or arrangement with the railroad. As we progress deeper and deeper in the facility, though, we'll find who is responsible for turning all of those raiders into bodies. Indeed, we'll slowly start encountering legions of Institute synths, who will attack the player unless you're already allied to their Institute masters. So, case closed, right? This place was a raider stronghold with some vague ties to the railroad, and was therefore targeted by the Institute and wiped by them. Well, it may not be so simple. You see, while most of the raider bodies we encounter are masked, if you decide to unmask them, you'll rapidly realize that they're all identical clones of each other. All of the male raiders have the exact same face as do all of the female ones, with only moderate changes to their hairstyle and paint. What? There's a pretty big debate within the community regarding whether or not Bethesda actually intended to do this. Many folks have argued that this could have simply been a developer error, and is meant to convey no serious narrative or meaning. However, as someone who's essentially been studying Bethesda games for a decade, I can say that this would be the first such bug I've ever encountered. I've never seen them just duplicate the same NPC corpses directly. Sometimes, if they're just using randomized raiders, the bodies can just come out looking the same on a certain playthrough, but an inspection of these raiders' reference IDs reveals that Bethesda placed them deliberately. The spawns aren't random, and they'll always look the same upon any given playthrough. If this was intentional, what's the deal here? Could these men and women have been more than just mere marauders? Perhaps escaped Institute clone projects? Maybe escaped synths who all opted for the same face? They lack synth components though, so I think that's a bit likely, but who am I to judge? No matter what was happening here, clearly it was something fishy. Alright, so this next one's a bit more meta, and I suppose fits in less as a single mystery, but I couldn't bear not to mention it in a video like this especially at Tier 3. How many players remain in the Great Game? So, the Great Game is a term we learn during the events of Fallout 3's Point Lookout DLC, where, during the main quest, the Lone Wanderer finds themselves in the middle of a jockey for power between a now ghoulified former British intelligence official named Desmond Lockhart and his lifelong nemesis, a Professor Calvert, who was once a brilliant US government scientist, but has since been reduced to a very angry brain in a jar. As both attest, they have been going at it for centuries, since well before the Great War, as a part of a conflict that they call the Great Game. Evidently, the impending nuclear destruction was already obvious to many elites and government officials in the lead up to the Great War, including Desmond and Calvert, and many of such folks took steps to ensure their survival. Those who succeeded continued their old rivalries in the aftermath. In Desmond's case, he deliberately exposed himself to controlled doses of radiation in order to become a ghoul that would be immune to the impending radioactive nuclear winners, and in Calvert's case, he opted for the less glamorous route of becoming a brain in a jar 
who is now worshipped by a small band of tribals who see him as a god. Calvert hates these people, but makes the most of their services in his struggle. It's never exactly made clear what initiated Desmond and Calvert's rivalry, which I suppose constitutes a reasonable mystery in its own right. All we know is that it began before the bombs fell, and at one point Desmond seems to have sabotaged Calvert's preferred presidential candidate in a plot involving a dog, I don't know, they're not very specific. Anyway, the player will be forced to choose between these two enigmatic individuals and put the other out of their misery. The question we're all left asking when the dust is settled, however, is who else is involved in this epic struggle? Speaking in an interview after the release of the Fallout 4 Point Lookout mod, which I've used for some of this segment's game capture, and you guessed it, ports Point Lookout to Fallout 4, link in the description, Fallout developer Joel Burgess said this about Desmond and Calvert's great game. Quote, I think we just really like the sort of Kessel Run thing, right? We liked leaving some opened hooks that we could always come back to and get your imagination on what else might happen. And if we ever came back to these characters, cool. And if we didn't, then at least it felt like they implied more than just they exist to fulfill the, your fantasy for this DLC. Later in the same interview, he would say, Yeah, I mean, there's like even a little stuff with Marcella, because I think Point Lookout's where we invented the Abbey of the Road, which is just like sort of this implied, even like the great game with Desmond and all that. We wanted to imply a grander universe, but not always get into the details. So, it's hard to remember how many of those things were like, sort of shoulder checks that we put in. You know, to like, put in little Kessel runs, and how much of that were like, no, no, we were actually gonna pull on that thread, but that bit was cut, wish I had a better answer. End quote. So, Bethesda had been toying with the idea of expanding this sort of story a bit further, but for now, it's left up to our imaginations. Presumably, folks like Robert House and perhaps much of the early Enclave could have been participants in this affair, but it likely goes well beyond them. And finally, last on our list, and wrapping up Tier 3, speaking of Desmond Lockhart, let's talk a little bit more about ghouls. Specifically, the unique phenomenon of pre-war ghouls and what exactly the Old World and its elites knew about them. So, we all know how ghouls are created, right? Folks who were exposed to radiation during the Great War, either an extremely high dose for a short period of time, or an extended period of smaller doses, had the potential to mutate into zombie-like creatures, with massively extended lifespans, less need for food and water, and near immunity to further radiation exposure though at the cost of some mental acuity and their reproductive systems. Ghouls are a staple of this franchise and represent everything about the Great War. However, there's indisputable evidence that ghoulification was happening before the bombs fell, and certain entities were able to leverage it to their advantage. We've already went over Fallout 3's Desmond Lockhart, how he turned himself into a ghoul to survive the Great War. But similar to him in Fallout 4, as a part of Nick Valentine's companion quest, the player will help the synth track down an ancient rival, a former crime boss named Eddie Winter, whom the personality Nick Valentine was based on had been trying to arrest prior to the Great War. While Nick's consciousness was downloaded and exported by the Institute, largely without his understanding, Eddie Winter had his own plans to survive the impending doom. Being tipped off to the impending conflict by an army agent on his payroll, and just being interested in preserving his own mortality regardless, Winters had an anonymous, but clearly in the know doctor, expose him to limited radiation doses in order for him to become a ghoul, which hence enabled him to survive the Great War and continue his shenanigans to this very day. The sole survivor must help Nick Valentine track this man down and finally put an end to his operation once and for all 200 years later. Furthermore, at the climax of Fallout 4's Automatron DLC, perhaps one of the most discounted Fallout expansions ever, 
The sole survivor is sent to Storm, the Mechanist's Lair, which is an old facility that was once operated jointly by the United States military and Robco. Here, we discover the two entities were experimenting on prisoners, wiping their memories and exporting their brains into robo-brains. We also discover strong evidence that Robco and the US government were deliberately ghoulifying at least some of their experimentees in secret well before the bombs fell in what was clearly a nuclear-proof bunker. So the United States government and Robert House both obviously recognized what ghouls were and were in the process of learning more about them in the lead-up to the conflict. The question, however, remains, just how much did these old governments know, and how far did they get with this technology? What did they use it for? Was the United States the only nation aware of this phenomena? Or, perhaps, did the Chinese know about it as well? Theoretically, their decreased need for food and water and ability to heal in the presence of radiation could make ghouls in some capacity useful soldiers or perhaps more efficient prisoners, as they don't need food. Alas, whatever the case, this is a plot point that I hope to see more of in future Fallout games. And ladies and gentlemen, on that final note of pre-war ghouls, we are going to wrap up the second part of what is likely going to be a four or, oh geez, maybe a five part long Fallout Mysteries Iceberg. I hope you all enjoyed. Again, icebergs by their very nature are the sort of thing that gets more and more interesting as you progress. So while I think this episode was much more engaging than the previous, I think parts four and five are going to absolutely be the best ones yet. One of the more frustrating things about this iceberg for me is that the earlier tiers are very Fallout 4 heavy. Um, part of that is just my own bias, you know, I've been covering Fallout 4 specifically for several years now, so I know a lot about it, and I'm assuming the audience does as well, so it makes sense for a lot of this stuff to be in the early tiers. But the other thing is that a lot of the isometric and 76 stuff really is, like, tier 4 and 5 material. Really heavy, esoteric, deep concepts. We're gonna be getting into stuff like time travel, ulterior dimensions, talking raccoons, liminal diners, all that stuff. So, well, I think this episode was um, less Fallout 4 heavy than part one. We're gonna continue slowly moving away from the game as the, uh, as, as the series goes forward. Also, couple of quick notes. November 11th of this year, 2023, is the beginning of Fallout New Vegas Day at the Pioneer Saloon in Good Springs, Nevada. Um, for those of you who don't know, Good Springs, Nevada isn't just a fictional place in Fallout New Vegas, it's, it's actually a real township in actual, uh, y you know, Nevada. And every year they hold a really big Fallout New Vegas celebration at the Pioneer Saloon there. This year it's going to be on November 11th and November 12th. There are usually thousands of people that show up, oftentimes in costume, lots of celebration and stuff. I personally plan on attending this year, and I thought I'd just help get the message out a little. You know, if you if you check your calendars and you're free on November 11th and 12th and, you know, want to dress up as an NCR Ranger or look at people dressed up as NCR Rangers, that is something you can do. There will be more information in the description. Lastly, we are literally just two weeks away from the release of Starfield, Bethesda's next big game. Of course I plan on covering it, that's something I'm, I'm extremely excited about. Fingers crossed it lives up to the hype, more like Red Dead Redemption 2 and less like Fallout 76. But I intend for that to probably dominate the channel, at least for the beginning of September, possibly the whole month of September. So part three and four of the iceberg may be um, a month or two away. I don't know, it's all gonna depend on those things. But those are, uh, are, are the epic news updates. Anyways, guys, thank you so much for stopping by. If you made it this far in the video, I very much appreciate it. Heck, I very much appreciate it if you only made it five minutes. So again, thank you all for watching, and I hope to catch you all in my next video. Peace out, everyone.